Uh, hope you're having a wonderful day. Um, so it was about a year ago that I, myself and a few of us uh, were in Brooklyn, uh, which was a, a hard commute of about 20 minutes for me. Um, and I was sort of interested in, in, in this whole serverless thing. Um, and then we had a conference, and uh, things sort of changed for me. And I found it fascinating. And I found it so fascinating that I decided uh, to write an article about everything that I'd learned. Um, and my good friend, Martin Fowler, asked me whether he would like to put it on his website. Um, and I said, sure, because you have 175,000 Twitter followers, and I don't. Uh, so it went on his website, and I'm, I'm sure some of you here have seen this. Um, and it was really popular, and I had a lot of uh, fun and learned a lot when I, when I was writing it. Um, this really sort of started a journey for me. Um, and then at the beginning of this year, in, in January, I actually started my own consulting business uh, around serverless called Symphonia with my friend uh, John Chapin, who is also here somewhere. He's waving at me. Um, and, and this is what we do now. We are literally dedicated to serverless. Um, really, I, I care about, in my career, how can I help uh, engineers be as awesome as they can be, whether that's through technology or, or through management. And, and, and this is something which I, has, has really captured my interest. Um, we have a, a book coming out in June with O'Reilly, so look out for that. Uh, there's going to be a lot of quotes uh, and links in this talk. Uh, don't worry too much about uh, photoing every, all of them, unless you want to put them on Twitter, in which case, go ahead. Um, there's a document for this, uh, which I've also just tweeted about, and so you can grab all the, uh, the quotes from there. Um, and the slides are also available from that document. So let's get going. Um, so over the last 20 years, we've seen the lead time of delivering software decrease from years to weeks. And now we see an opportunity to reduce this further to days or even hours. That's OK. Sorry. Uh, so, so, we, so we have the opportunity to bring this down to, to days or even hours. So what advantages would doing this bring? And what challenges would we face in doing this? And how would we surmount those challenges? So these are questions that I'm going to explore in this talk today. So in the first section, I want to take you on a journey from how life used to be in software engineering uh, to how it can be today. But first, let's all get a little philosophical for a moment. What is the point of software engineering? It's a question that we don't think about too often, because we're wrapped up in our day-to-day -day lives of actually doing it. So one answer to this question is to enable our customer uh, or users to be more awesome. And that means to make them able to do something that they couldn't do before, or let them do something that they've already done before far more efficiently, or at far higher quality, or at less cost. My, uh, my friend Dan North has a slightly different answer for this question. He says, the goal of software is to sustainably minimize lead time to business impact. The point is that we're not here just to deliver software. We're not in the deliverables business. We're interested in outcomes, the delight of our users, and what they can do with our software. Dan also talks here about lead time. And that is the time from an idea being in our heads to getting it in the hands of a user. And in fact, a key part of improving our impact is reducing the lead time. Reducing lead time is our goal, because it gets useful software in the hands of the users faster, which is a nice side effect. It gets the money into our bank accounts faster. But it also lets us try more ideas. Well, why is that more important? Well, I'll get onto that in a little while. But first of all, a little quick history lesson. I can't really see you that well, because the lights are very bright up here. But who here has been in the industry for more than 15 years? Good. Oh, thank you very much, lighting booth. Uh, so a few of us. For those of you that weren't around doing this 15 years ago, I can tell you that it typically took anywhere from six months to two years to deliver a new piece of software. Sounds ridiculous now, right? So why was that? Well, back in the old days, releasing software was expensive, because change management was expensive, and testing was expensive, and a whole multitude of other reasons. And so we optimized our processes for large groups of people 
working on one product area with a small number of releases. Infrastructure and the labor to manage it was expensive, and so we optimized our architecture to reduce the total number of components that we deployed. We often used multi-tenancy of various configurations and various customers into one runtime. And additionally, changing infrastructure was expensive. We needed to use the same infrastructure over months and years for it to be cost effective. And this is a big reason why traditionally our production infrastructure has been mutable, changeable, with all the complexities that that brings. All of these constraints drove us to a project mentality in how we worked in industrial software teams. We needed significant technical, data, and organizational coordination across large groups of people, leading to processes like waterfall and techniques like Gantt charts. Over the years, our constraints have changed. Releasing is not nearly as expensive as it was. Practices like continuous delivery have allowed us to optimize our build, test, and deployment processes through extensive automation. We've also seen huge reductions in the cost of infrastructure and the management of infrastructure through the maturing of public clouds. Not only have the overall costs been reduced, but we can now also modify much of our infrastructure without loss of capital because of the elastic provisioning that the cloud gives us. Immutable infrastructure is now a reasonable possibility, allowing the new trend of thinking about how we can consider our servers as cows rather than kittens. Because of these changes in constraints, we are now able to release software much more frequently. Continuous deployment of several releases to day, of, per day is now commonplace. Even with large enterprises, there's a quote here from uh, Sri Kote of, of Comcast Cable last year where he said, we used to ship our product every 12 to 18 months. In a three to five year period, we shipped three or four releases. Now we ship three releases every week. This is a massive change, even in a big enterprise like Comcast. Tied in with these improvements in cycle time, we've also seen lead time that I talked about earlier decreased. Now we often talk of lead time for new projects or new features in days or weeks rather than months or years. And these reductions in cycle and lead times have changed how we approach software delivery. Instead of focusing on projects and deliverables, we can now spend much more time considering the product that we're actually trying to build. Or, in other words, instead of focusing on how many things we can build, our output, we can instead optimize for the effectiveness of our software in the hands of the customer, the outcome that it has. Now, a lead time of days and weeks is a vast improvement over the months and years that we saw 15 years ago. But we can do better than that, even. So here's a quote from Adrian Cockcroft, who's at AWS now, but he used to be uh, the chief architect at Netflix. He said, we're starting to see applications be built in ridiculously short time periods. Now we're able to actually start thinking about lead time in hours. As we reduce our lead time further and further like this, we can start focusing more on two very important points. First of all, we don't know up front what the best solution is. What we're making is not something that we've made before. Building software products is a complex problem. And when we start working on a feature or a product, we have an idea of what we're trying to implement, but there's a problem with that. Most of our ideas suck. It's true. Even though when we're working on a particular idea, they feel great. History dictates that it turns out most of them aren't. Most of the things we build never really get used or don't really work very well. Most of our ideas suck. But if we have an environment where we can deliver an idea from scratch in hours, we can try out many, many more ideas. And not all of our ideas suck, just most of them. In other words, we can play a numbers game. And this way, we are far more likely to come across a winner, the one that is going to make our customer awesome. We've already decided that pretty much all companies have to be tech companies now, because if they're not, then an actual tech company is going to come along and blow them out of the water. However, enterprises can now start moving beyond being just technology companies 
and embrace experimentation as their core system of work. Now, startups have been thinking about this for years using ideas from Lean Startup. They can build minimum viable products, assess success, and keep pivoting to new ideas until they find one which works. Enterprises can start thinking this way because of the much shorter lead times that we are now seeing in software development. We need to stop thinking of our software organizations as feature factories. This mindset of the never-ending backlog is a remnant of working in a project-based, output-oriented environment, optimized for releases, for few releases. But this system is out of date. Instead, we can transform our organizations into product laboratories, embracing a model of continuous experimentation. And this will allow us to build products that truly make our customers awesome. So such a significant rethinking of how we approach software engineering doesn't come without challenges. How do we get to this point of continuous experimentation? Well, let's look at some of these challenges across technical and organizational spectrums. First of all, some technical challenges. We want to minimize incidental complexity, and that is the amount of complexity that we need to solve that really doesn't have anything to do with the problem that we're trying to uh, solve. But we still need to have valid, safe production deployment that works at scale. We want to maximize the amount of our engineering time that we can on the core of the actual user problem that we're trying to solve. We want to reduce the, we want to reduce the infrastructure cost and commitment for deploying a new system. An experiment might only last a couple of days, and we don't want to be locked into an expensive system. And we also want to reduce the technological overhead from having many different experiments. We're going to have, to, we're going to have lots and lots of small systems if we work this way, and how do we have sufficient decoupling? Now let's look at some organizational and cultural challenges. We need to minimize the time it takes to go from our code being ready to, to it actually being deployed for the first time. And there are technical and process concerns here. We need to change the culture of our organizations to encourage continuous learning. We're not doing the same thing repetitively in a feature factory anymore. And product innovation needs to be spread around teams and not just the responsibility of product managers so that we can source a whole raft of ideas and can move forward through them fast enough. This is going to be a much less structured world that we live in, and so we need to rethink how we approach the idea of safety. We need to make it safe to fail. We need to enable a psychologically safe environment for our experiments to fail. We also need to maintain budgetary safety in a significantly more dynamic environment. And we also need to maintain appropriate security and data access safety. Now, these aren't the only challenges. <laughs> But they're enough to get us thinking about the types of changes that we're going to need to make. And we're going to spend the, most of the rest of this talk talking about how we're going to go about solving these. And the good news is that we've already got most of the tools that we need. So unsurprisingly, given this audience, serverless is a key technique for resolving many of the technical challenges uh, that we have in this brave new world of continuous experimentation. So first of all, a quick reminder, uh, serverless is products like Amazon Lambda, uh, Google Firebase, uh, Auth0, uh, Amazon S3, which I think is the original serverless product, even though people think I'm weird, uh, and Amazon DynamoDB. And these are all technologies that require no management of server hosts or processes. They self-auto-provision and auto-scale based on load, and they have costs based on actual precise usage and not on something that we have to pre-plan. They have other attributes, too, uh, but these are the ones that I care about most at this point. So let's start looking at our challenges. How do we minimize incidental complexity with serverless? Well, first of all, we have a bunch of pre-built logic in services like Auth0 and Amazon Cognito, a machine learning service, that we can incorporate as a service into our applications. Serverless provides a very lightweight model for custom code in functions as a service. It handles a significant proportion of our system's administration setup for our general compute and for data storage and communication networking infrastructure. 
And it scales out horizontally without any or any significant effort. And this is important because our experiments aren't valid a lot of the time unless, that we, can, unless we can test them at scale. Our second challenge was reducing infrastructure costs. Remember, we're looking to reduce the cost and the commitment for deploying a new system. Serverless means that we have very little overhead cost, and most costs are based on precise actual usage. Our costs scale up from and down to zero. And in traditional systems, it makes sense from a cost optimization point of view to co-locate lots and lots of different features into one system. And that brings complexity, because any new work that we're thinking of typically has to tie into an existing app, and that adds complexity. With serverless, uh, this optimization need goes away completely, because costs don't work that way. Our code costs the same whether it's running in one type of application or 15 types of application. And this is a really, really big deal. And I, don't, and I think it's one that many of us haven't really grasped yet, because it's so different to the way that we've built systems in the past. Our third challenge was to minimize tech debt. Uh, we need a technical platform that actively encourages decoupling of components. And that's what we get with the event-driven, granular nature that we get with serverless. Serverless today provides a great foundation here, but there's still a lot of work that we all need to do to figure out patterns of good, highly decomposed architecture that work well over time. I want to mention something at this point. So a lot of times we talk about serverless, and I mention them here, we're talking about cost savings. And the cost savings of serverless are useful and significant. But they're not really the exciting benefits that serverless brings. If you're only using serverless for cost savings, you're actually missing a big trick. Serverless also offers the chance to bring about the change in delivery mindset of continuous experimentation that, was, that I'm introducing in this talk. But serverless as a technical platform is not sufficient for this transformation. Our organizations need to change, too. So let's dig into some of those. Continuous experimentation is about both continuously delivering new tests and about making those tests provide ever more value to our users. So how do we need to change our organizations to make this happen? The key lever as we start looking into organizational concerns is DevOps, but specifically DevOps culture. That is bringing development, operations, and other engineering activities much closer together rather than having them performed in strictly siloed organizations. In many cases, we're going to bring these activities onto one team. But even if we don't do that, then we need to remove things like work queues between teams. The DevOps handbook is going to be a huge help for you as you expand your thinking in this way and is the most up-to-date digest of everything DevOps by the leaders in the subject. It came out last year, and it's by Gene Kim and Jez Humble and a few other folks. And it's absolutely brilliant. I can't recommend it enough. I used this book quite significantly as I was preparing this talk. OK, let's get back to our challenges. So our fourth challenge was minimizing initial deployment time. So DevOps has done a great job of improving our cycle time, allowing our teams to practice continuous deployment. Those techniques are useful for us here, but we need more. We need to improve our zero to production time. Let's remember what we're up to here. We're saying that we want to build new systems uh, within a few hours. And much of that time is going to involve coding. So that leaves very, very little time to launch our software for the first time, maybe just an hour or two, or maybe just minutes. To be able to do this a time and again, we need to perform uh, we need automation to bring up these entirely new systems. And we have that in a platform in serverless that can react to our requests easily. But we also need process and culture that will support that in our organizations. Uh, number five, we, we need a culture of learning. There is no point having continuous experimentation unless we also have continuous learning. A big point of each experiment is feed, a big point of, of each experiment is the feedback that we get for figuring out what the next experiment is going to be. But oftentimes, that's actually not the way that we work in our big, bigger companies. When we're engineers in feature factories, we just take requirements and crunch them up, often with the same old techniques because we're under time pressure, and then repeat. And learning is not something that we're thinking about. But now we need to place learning as important as delivery. And this is going to come in various forms. 
First of all, we need to change our approach to management. No longer is it useful to build backlogs of work three months out and track progress to that as part of our effectiveness. We need to continuously learn and adjust what our product needs to be on a much more finely grained uh, way. Part of this change is also on us as engineers. When we're in the process of writing code, what are we optimizing for? Writing the perfectly designed, highly efficient solution isn't necessarily the most appropriate thing to do for learning about the technology or the customer's need. Perhaps copying and pasting code is actually the best thing sometimes, as long as we commit to stabilizing it at a later date if it proves valuable. Mostly what we want to do is the smallest amount of code in order to test a hypothesis. So Dan North has been doing uh, a ton of great work on this front for a few years now um, in his area that he calls Software Faster. Um, and there's some links in the resource document. And I highly encourage you uh, to check out his, his, video, uh, his videos and the book that he's working on. OK, sixth challenge. It's also the whole team's responsibility to change how we think of ownership. Product management is now a mindset and not just an individual. The most effective engineering teams are the ones that consider customer affinity, uh, not just the best technical solution. Not every individual on a team needs to wear every hat of what we need to do as a team. But we have to break down all of our silos of role across software delivery, including the so-called non-technical ones. Now, I've seen many developers excel in thinking about product ownership. When we treat our engineers as just code robots, when we're not really untapping their full potential. As we change product development from being a project process to, uh, of, of regular cadence over time to one of continuous experimentation, and feedback-based redirection, we need to drastically change how we approach risk and safety. Experiments are going to fail. Product expectations are going to mutate. And the requirements of our technical environment is going to change drastically and quickly. Safe experimentation is not a contradiction in terms. This is what science labs do all the time. So how do we approach safety in our product labs? First and most importantly, we need to allow our people to feel safe by creating an environment where failure is not something to be scared of. Google figured this out years ago. The New York Times wrote a great article about Google's own introspective studies, and it includes this quote. Google's data indicated that psychological safety, more than anything else, was critical to making a team work. This may seem reasonable, but how much effort do we put into this in our organizations normally? The best companies adopt failure as part of their process. Here's a quote from Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, uh, about the wonderful Fire Phone. Who remembers the Fire Phone? He said, because it, it was a complete failure, he said, if you think that's a big failure, we're working on much bigger failures right now, and I am not kidding. Some of them are going to make the Fire Phone look like a tiny little blip. I don't think he was talking about the S3 outage the other week, but you know, maybe he was. If we value experimentation, we must actively embrace failure as learning, and not just merely treat it as an unfortunate side effect. So how do we go about making our cultures ones in which it is safe to fail? Well, one idea is to start with blameless post-mortems. Here's a quote from Bethany Macri, an engineer from Etsy in New York, about blameless postmortems, where, which is somewhere Etsy use this all the time. She said, by removing blame, you remove fear. By removing fear, you enable honesty, and honesty enables prevention. Of course, it's not enough to just think about the safety of our coworkers. We also need to think about the safety of our business. And there are several areas to be concerned about, but I want to talk about infrastructural budget. How do we make it safe to create whole new stacks of infrastructure on a frequent basis without bankrupting our companies? Well, a couple of ideas is we need visibility and ownership into how much we're spending on our actual teams. And we also need to introduce automation and tooling. That is, we need our teams to be able to know how much they have spent on a daily, on a daily basis and how that compares over the last days and weeks and months. 
we should actively seek out and, delight and, and delete any unassigned systems. And we need to really have the idea of per team and per account uh, soft and hard limits for costs. Now, I don't think this really exists in our platforms yet, but we're really going to need it. Our final challenge was about data and security safety. So we need to make security work as much a part of a team's responsibility as anything else, and considering it like operations in our teams. We need to build shared tooling across the organization in a way that protects data, but also gives us enough flexibility for experimentation. Where possible, we want to give teams autonomy of many access controls, building review in and exposing changes as part of a system of work. And we need to actively update cross-organizational change request processes to optimize for flow when team, when team autonomy alone is insufficient. And there's a ton of this stuff, again, in the DevOps handbook. So that's all of our challenges discussed. There are many areas to consider when we think about moving to continuous experimentation. But as I hope you've seen, we actually already have many of the tools that we need. But what about the questions that we haven't answered and the challenges that we haven't yet discovered? What is our framework for considering these? This is where modern agile can help. Modern agile is a set of four values that take the core of how agile soft software development was originally conceived and brings it up to date for an experimentation-focused culture. It's come out of the work of uh, Joshua Karievsky uh, and the other folks at Industrial Logic in, in California. And they've been thinking about agile and extreme programming, which is sort of their main preferred technique, for nearly 20 years. As a set of values, modern agile doesn't give us a prescribed process for solving all of our problems. It's just 14 words. But it does give us a framework for asking useful questions. So I used these values. Uh, as, I was, as I was figuring out what I wanted to discuss in this talk. So let's look at these four values now and see how they fit as we consider transforming our feature factories to product labs. So the first value of modern agile is make people awesome. Here we're considering customer satisfaction, but also we're considering our own, our own organization's people in the understanding that the more powerful our teams become, the more we can do for our customer. Questions that this brings up include things like, what will make our customers awesome? How do we give our team members superpowers? Next up, experiment and learn rapidly. This is taking the ideas of lean startup and bringing them to the larger world. What can we learn on a regular basis? How do we approach experimentation in a structured form? Deliver value continuously. So unsurprisingly, the root of this value is all the work that has been going into continuous delivery over the last 10 and 15 years. But the point of continuous delivery isn't just a process of turning wheels. How do we make what we do valuable? And how do we get that value frequently and regularly to our customers? Finally, make safety a prerequisite. With such an environment of change and uncertainty, how can we make it safe to experiment? We need a safe environment for our team members, for our companies, and our customers. What are the areas of risk in our daily work? What are the limits of, experiment, of our experimentation environment? And how do, we build, how do we build appropriate safety nets? So in this talk, I've shown that we now have the ability to have idea to production lead times of hours as opposed to years. And this enables us to think about how we approach product development in a whole new way, one of continuous experimentation rather than the old project mindsets that we've used in the past. Serverless provides us with a technical platform to do this. But serverless alone is not sufficient to enable this change in our organizations. Modern Agile provides a value framework to help enable our organizations to evolve for this new way of thinking, which leaves the question, how will you transform your organization from a feature factory to a product laboratory? I hope I've given you some inspiration today, 
that, and, and some ideas that you can take back to your own teams. Some resources for this talk are up at that link and on my Twitter. Uh, I will be around all week, and feel free to email me as well. I also have, for those of you that love stickers for your laptop, I have stickers of that modern agile thing, so come grab them if you want. Thank you very much for listening.